Disclaimer, the law is always changing. This visual aid is provided for informational purposes only, and it should not be treated as legal advice. If you are seeking legal advice, you should contact a lawyer directly who will consider your particular circumstances and apply the law to the facts presented. The information today pertains to New Jersey. Outside of New Jersey, you should consult a lawyer licensed in your jurisdiction. Your attendance at an LSNWJ community education presentation does not form an attorney attorney client relationship between you and legal services of Northwest Jersey. Any information shared publicly in a community education forum is not confidential and is not subject to attorney client privilege. Do not email confidential information unless or until legal services of Northwest Jersey agrees to provide you with legal assistance. Right into expungements. Um, Again, my name is Scott Dranoff. I am the team leader for our autonomy team, and I'm going to be talking about expungements here today. I'm very excited to, to be with you. Thanks for your time and attention. Um, so a little of this Carol already covered, so I'm not going to do too much about what we do. Um, I will reiterate that uh, if you think you might benefit from our services, to please, please reach out um, so that we can either assist you or point you in the right direction. Um, because we are recording today, I'm going to encourage folks to hold questions for the end. Um, you know, if, if you have an issue uh, with anything that I've that I've said, or if you think I, I might have been unclear, um, you can certainly write it out. You can put it in the chat, um, and we'll address those at the end of the presentation today. Uh, some of the information that I'm going to be referring to and relying on is available online for folks who want to do a deep dive into this area. Um, a lot of this information is available on lsnjlaw.org. Uh, clearing Your Record, it's a, an online pamphlet. And Clearing Your Record Online is a web application that used to get a lot of use um, in helping folks actually go through the expungement process um, because of some changes in the law that's, that's no longer um, as frequently used. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, there's a privately operated website uh, called njexpungements.com that has some useful information. And of course, the statute itself, uh, which is sort of heavy reading, it's, there's 32 separate sections to it, um, but for folks who really want to get into the law, uh, you can view that at New Jersey Statutes Annotated 2C colon 52-1. It goes all the way up to 52-32, so folks who are interested in some light bedtime reading to help you get to sleep, uh, by all means, take a look at that. Uh, a couple notes before we get started. This is a rapidly evolving area of the law, um, so the changes that I'm going to be discussing today were originally supposed to take effect in June of 2020. They were signed into law um, late 2019. Um, as you know, there was a pandemic and that delayed everything. So um, the changes were delayed until February of this year and the changes have been implemented, although some um, are implemented on a rolling basis. So we're not all the way there yet, but the new laws are officially a go. So uh, what I'm gonna be covering today, first, some background. What is expungement? and what expungement is not. Uh, there's a great deal of confusion surrounding that, so I wanna make sure that I set the stage uh, for everybody's understanding. Uh, I'm gonna spend the bulk of our time today on determining eligibility for an expungement. Um, how do you know if your record is in fact eligible for an expungement? Um, and then I'll spend a little bit of time on the filing process, which again is, is new um, as of February this year. So we'll talk about that in brief. Um, and thanks again for being here today. So first off, what is expungement? So the statute defines expungement as the extraction, sealing, impounding, or isolation of all records on file. That's a little bit jargony, so I'm going to pantomime for you what an expungement is. Okay, I'm going to take this record that's over here on this shelf, and I'm going to move it to this shelf over here. I've just expunged that record. That's the whole process. That's an expungement. Uh, now, most of these records are digital at this point, so so you know, bear with me on the on the old timey pantomime. But you know, the idea is the records are not actually physically destroyed. Um, when I first heard the term expungement, I was picturing the records maybe being brought down to the courthouse basement and thrown in the furnace, or you know, in an ideal world, placed on a rocket shot into space. They're not. Um, they're just moved. They're moved to a different shelf. Now, um, this, this area uh, is not accessible to most people. Uh, it's not accessible to the public under most circumstances. Uh, and the expungement does remove certain barriers to employment and housing and other statutory bars. Uh, importantly for our clients, a successful petitioner, somebody who has had their record expunged, does have a legal right to indicate that they have a clean record, uh, which gets asked often um, in different contexts. 
Um, so a, a couple of other things that expungement is, is not. Uh, expungement is not available for out-of-state criminal records. So if you have a criminal conviction in North Carolina, say, and you complete an, um, a successful expungement petition in New Jersey, the New Jersey petition is not going to impact the criminal law in North Carolina. Uh, New Jersey's laws only reach as far as the boundaries of the state. Uh, expungement is not available for motor vehicle code violations, including driving while intoxicated, uh, or if you have too many points on your license. Um, expungement does not reach those items. Expungement is not a Mr. Clean magic eraser for the internet. So unfortunately, if, if you get arrested or if you get convicted for doing something um, and that makes the news or uh, your former friend from high school puts it up on his or her Facebook page or tweets it out, uh, it's going to remain on those platforms. It's going to remain on the internet. Now, it's certainly possible that at some point in the future, uh, state or federal government will limit um, the scope of these private companies uh, and what they put online, but that's not the case right now. And the New Jersey expungement law does not reach these companies. So if something gets on Facebook, uh, the expungement process does not take it off of Facebook. Subsequent criminal cases, arrests, or incarcerations. Um, these are also not addressed by the expungement process. Expungement is, is retroactive. It's looking at things that happened in the past and clearing those things from the record. Uh, but if something happens in the future, uh, that is not reached by the expungement process. In fact, in, in many cases, the, um, the things that happen in the future could result in the things that happened in the past becoming publicly available again or unexpunged. Um, again, there are a couple organizations and agencies that have a right to access uh, this expungement shelf. So we have the Victims of Crime Compensation Office, Pretrial Intervention and Controlled Dangerous Substances Registries, um, and law enforcement agencies, including state and federal agencies, do all have access to expunged records. Um, they're only looking at them in very specific circumstances, but they do have access to them. Um, and finally, records that are the subject of litigation. So if you have a criminal case, and a criminal attorney. And then after the fact, you decide that your criminal attorney did such a poor job that you'd like to file a malpractice lawsuit against him or her. Well, the malpractice lawsuit is going to center on the criminal case and the records of that litigation. And so the expunged records will be allowed to be brought into the um, civil case on that litigation. And unless a court orders that the civil case proceed under seal or under protective order, um, those records will be public, publicly available. Um, so those are some areas where expungement does not reach. Um, now we're going to talk um, a good deal about um, determining eligibility for an expungement. So first I'll cover some preliminary notes that, that'll kind of set the stage for us in determining eligibility. Then we're going to talk about evaluating the calendar for eligibility. How long has it been? And how long has it been since what? We'll talk about that too. Um, and different, uh, different circumstances where a waiting period has, has not been met, has almost been met. Uh, then we're going to talk about evaluating the record for eligibility for an expungement. Um, and that's literally what is on an individual's criminal history record. We'll talk about partial record and whole record expungement, we'll talk about the clean slate expungement, which is new uh, as of February this year. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about my favorite pun in the entire presentation, um, the pothole. Um, there is some expungement legislation that's gone through. There's some marijuana legislation that's gone through. And there's a little bit of a gap. Um, and so we're gonna talk about that as well. Um, okay, so some preliminary notes. <clears throat> Eligibility for expungement is 100% about the record of the petitioner. What does the criminal history record, what does the piece of paper say? And yes, it is still often a piece of paper or a packet of paper. It's literally a report that you can get uh, from a number of places, including the state police. What is on that piece of paper? It's not about whether the petitioner actually did what's on the paper, uh, except in cases of identity theft or fraud. Uh, it's not about whether the court or the prosecutor got something wrong or made a mistake. And it's not about whether there's institutional bias in the criminal justice system. Um, these are all obviously very important questions um, that should be addressed. It's just that the expungement process is not the tool to address them. Uh, the expungement process cannot get at any of these underlying factors. The expungement process can only reach literally what is on the petitioner's record. Um, the other thing I wanna note is I'm gonna spend a little bit of time in a minute talking about evaluating the calendar, um, and then we're gonna spend some time talking about evaluating the record. Um, what I wanna ask folks to keep in mind while we're doing that is that eligibility for an expungement requires both 
the calendar, the amount of time, and the record, the amount of things on a petitioner's record um, to qualify, to meet the statutory requirements um, in order for a petitioner to be eligible for an expungement. So we're gonna talk about calendar, we're gonna talk about record. They both need to meet the statute in order for a petitioner to be eligible for an expungement. So <clears throat> next up, evaluating the calendar. This slide is a little bit dense. Um, so we're gonna talk about a couple things here. First, uh, first and most important thing for you to know, the calendar, um, the clock for when an individual is eligible for an expungement, the clock starts ticking when everything is completed, any incarceration is completed and a petitioner has been released from supervision, um, probation or parole, and any and all fines have been paid. Um, to put it as simply as possible, the clock starts ticking when all of the punishment is over. Um, the clock does not start ticking when the petitioner is arrested or when the petitioner has first been convicted. It doesn't start until all of the punishment is over. Uh, everything is completed. Second thing to note about this slide, um, I'm going to direct your attention to the left column where it says type of conviction slash application. Um, and you'll see some, some words here you might not be familiar with. Indictable in that first row, disorderly persons in that second row, municipal ordinance violation um, in that row, second from the bottom. What are these things? Well, if you watch a lot of law and order, you'll be familiar with um, a felony. So New Jersey calls felony convictions indictables. Um, so an indictable is a felony, a felony is an indictable. Um, we have our own legal jargon for criminal code. But what you need to know here is an indictable is a felony. Disorderly persons is what you will recognize as a misdemeanor. Uh, these are lower level offenses, uh, not the highest level. Indictable or felony is the highest level. Disorderly persons or misdemeanor is a lower level. Um, and then there's municipal ordinance violation, which is uh, the lowest level. Um, these are things like crossing the street where there's no crosswalk or being in public with an open container of alcohol or in some cases, failing to mow your lawn frequently enough according to municipal ordinances. These are offenses that, that we, um, for anybody who's been to law school, we call uh, malum prohibitum, uh, which is Latin for bad because it's prohibited. So these are bad because they're prohibited. They are not malum in se, uh, bad in and of themselves. And these are not morally reprehensible offenses. They're low level uh, offenses, just you're breaking the rules and society runs better when everybody follows them. So for municipal ordinance violations, um, you may also hear these called citations. Um, again, these are the lowest level offenses. Okay, so um, what you can see in the left column here is uh, for the most part, these are organized by um, the amount of time it's gonna take uh, from the completion of the punishment to eligibility for expungement. So we'll move over to the middle column, the time passed. So for an indictable conviction, um, and the, you can ignore the stuff in the parentheses for now. I'm going to get to that in more detail when we get to the evaluating the record portion. Uh, but what you need to know is for an indictable conviction, uh, you need to wait five years. The petitioner needs to wait five years from the completion of all uh, incarceration, probation, parole, and fines um, before a petitioner is eligible for an expungement. For disorderly persons, it's the same amount of time. Uh, however, uh, as I'll address in more detail in the next slide, if a uh, petitioner is filing for public interest expungement, that timeline can be cut down. So public interest expungement for an indictable conviction, a uh, petitioner needs to wait only four years, not five. And for a disorderly person's um, public interest expungement, the petitioner needs to wait only three years. Uh, municipal ordinance violations do not get a public interest option. Um, folks have to wait two years, um, but there is no prohibition. You can file for an expungement of your municipal ordinance violations every two years for the rest of your life um, there's no limit on those. Uh, the clean slate provision I'm also going to get to in a future slide, but the thing to note here is the clean slate provision becomes applicable 10 years after all punitive measures have been completed. Just a moment to let all of that information sink in. Uh, okay, so public interest expungements. This is about timing. Um, as you'll see in, in a future slide, some folks have more um, convictions of a given category than are eligible. And clients will ask me, well, can I get a public interest expungement? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Public interest expungements are available um, if there is a, a timing issue that has not been long enough. 
um, the petition is too early to otherwise be expunged. So in order to qualify for a public interest expungement, the petitioner's record needs to uh, otherwise qualify, it needs to meet the, um, the record requirements. Uh, the court needs to find in its discretion that compelling circumstances exist to grant the expungement. Um, now, there's some disagreement as to whether this is an easier standard than it used to be or a harder standard than it used to be. The standard used to be that the court has to find that it is in the public interest, uh, granting due consideration to the offenses um, and the public's need for this information, um, that the record be expunged. Personally, I think that this standard is probably a little bit easier than that standard, but we haven't had a lot of cases yet um, to give us that definitive answer. Um, the other reason why a petitioner might be eligible for a public interest expungement is if they've done everything, they've completed incarceration, probation, parole, et cetera, but they haven't paid their fines yet. Um, in this case, if the fine remains unpaid or partially unpaid for reasons other than willful noncompliance, um, then a public interest expungement can be granted. So say it's been five years since the petitioner um, completed everything after an indictable conviction, but they haven't paid that fine. Well, under the public interest exception, um, they can still get an expungement. What the court will do now is the court will enter a civil judgment against the petitioner for the outstanding amount. So, you know, the bill doesn't go away, it's still due, but it will not um, impede a petition for expungement under this category. So next we're gonna talk about evaluating the record. And again, um, just a quick um, roadmap, we're going to talk about if I, excuse me, expunging a whole record, expunging a partial record, um, doing performing a clean slate expungement, uh, and of course, no presentation on expungements would be complete without addressing the pothole. All right, so uh, the whole record to completely expunge a petitioner's record today, there are four preliminary requirements that must be met. This is true for every expungement petition. So if, if you only take away one thing from today's presentation, if you're, if you're out there memorizing, we're gonna review this uh, after it's been recorded. Um, these are the things to remember. Number one, you can have no charges currently pending against the petitioner. Uh, number two, there can be no non-expungible convictions. I'm gonna explain what those are in a little bit, um, but the, the term is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, there can be no convictions that are ineligible for expungement. Um, there can be no subsequent convictions. So again, we're, we're trying to expunge this bucket of convictions here. If something has happened since that time, subsequent to what we're trying to expunge, um, then these will not be eligible for an expungement. Um, and the timing requirements need to be met. Um, and we just talked about those. The timing requirements are based on what's on the individual's record. Okay. If all four of those are met, uh, the preliminaries are met, then we look to the specifics in order to determine if a petitioner's record is eligible for an expungement. A record is going to be eligible for expungement if it has, um, if it falls into one of the following three categories. Uh, number one, if there is only one indictable conviction on the record. Um, number two, if there are only five disorderly persons convictions on the record, five or fewer. Uh, and number three, if there is only one indictable conviction um, and three or fewer disorderly persons convictions. Okay, so these are the, the upper limits. A record that has more than these cannot be fully expunged um, immediately. All right, we'll talk about the alternative options available to folks in that situation in a little bit. So again, um, one indictable conviction or up to five disorderly persons convictions or one indictable conviction and up to three disorderly persons convictions. Um, so you may have seen on that last slide, it's one or a spree, uh, five or a spree. So what, what is a spree? Well, <clears throat> there, there's two ways to think about this. One is if everything appears on the same judgment of conviction, that's the court's order um, entering the conviction for these offenses. That's a spree. Um, the statute also defines a spree as, <clears throat> excuse me, Offenses that were interdependent or closely related in circumstances and were committed as part of a sequence of events that took place within a comparatively short period of time. Perfectly clear, right? Not jargony at all. So I'm going to give you an example that will, that will make this a little bit clearer. So say we are years in the past and petitioner has stolen a motor vehicle and that motor vehicle has a CD player in it. 
Uh, now, some of you may remember CDs. They, they were these, these circular disc uh, things. You, you put them into a machine and music would come out. It was, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, the car's got a CD player. So the petitioner steals a the car. Then um, they need some CDs. So they go to a music store. That's also a thing uh, from the past music store. Um, and they steal some CDs from the music store. Okay. And they put them in the car and they play them. Uh, these are two offenses. Um, they were closely related in circumstances and committed in a relatively short period of time. This would be a spree. Okay. Um, so this, even though it was two separate offenses and could reasonably be charged uh, as two separate indictables, it can be treated for purposes of expungement as one indictable conviction, the spree, one indictable spree. Um, same thing is true if you have multiple disorderly persons convictions uh, or offenses that take place you know, in, in those circumstances. They can be treated as one spree, and a spree will be treated as an indictable conviction. So what are the non-expungible convictions? So um, another way to think about this for my Harry Potter fans, um, these are like the unforgivable curses. Um, if you haven't read the books or seen the movies, that's not gonna, it's not gonna flow, but I encourage you, to, you know, they're, they're fun. So um, another way to think about this uh, for, for some of my more literary members is uh, it's like the Scarlet Letter, right? That once you have the Scarlet Letter, it doesn't come off, it's permanent. And if anybody out there has read the Scarlet Letter, but not Harry Potter, well, good for you. Um, all right, so what are the, um, what are the non-expungible convictions? These are things that you might think of as uh, things that we wouldn't want to come off of the record. This is also the legislature's answer to the question or the, the objection. Well, I think everything should be on the record because if you do something bad, it needs to stay on your record. Well, they agree uh, for some things. So um, these are things that you might consider. And these are, uh, for folks who remember our vocab lesson earlier, these are malum in se. These are bad because they have been, they are considered to be morally reprehensible. They are not malum prohibitum or bad because they are prohibited. So um, what, are, what are these expungements? So criminal homicide, kill somebody, stays on the record. Uh, kidnapping, related offenses, including human trafficking. Uh, sexual offenses, including rape and sexual assault. Robbery, arson. Uh, terrorism, and I'm going to contrast terrorism for folks um, with terroristic threats. Terrorism, um, we're all familiar with acts of terror that have been, been um, completed in the United States, um, the Boston Marathon bombing, the 9-11 uh, attacks. That's terrorism. Terroristic threats is when you threaten violence against somebody. Um, often, if, if I've given this presentation in, in Atlantic City, and uh, after the presentation, folks go out to the bar and they get inebriated and you'll hear terroristic threats taking place in the bar. That's, that's a terroristic threat. Um, that is expungible. Terrorism is not expungible. Uh, endangering the welfare of children, including child pornography and child abuse, is not expungible. Perjury, so any lying under oath is not expungible. Lying under oath, is not expungible. Abuse of public office, also not expungible. So if you're a publicly appointed or elected official and you commit a criminal offense that touches on the office, um, that stays on your record forever. So it, it's worth being aware of for anybody who has uh, aspirations of public office. Um, and then this one is a little bit complex. We're gonna do this in, in a little in stages. The sale, distribution, or possession with intent to sell of controlled dangerous substances. Now, this has been amended by the expungement statutes. It's also been amended by the marijuana statutes. So bear with me here. Um, the sale distribution or possession with intent to sell is broken down into degrees. So if it's a first or second degree sale distribu distribution or possession with intent, it is not expungible. It falls under that same category um, as non-expungible. If it is a third or fourth degree conviction, then the court has to find compelling circumstances in order to expunge it. Uh, you may recall that compelling circumstances standard from a few slides ago in the public interest case. It's, that's, it's the same standard. The court has to find compelling circumstances to expunge a conviction for a third or fourth degree um, sale distribution or possession with intent. Uh, with one exception, and that's fourth degree marijuana. Um, fourth degree marijuana convictions are um, regularly expungible. Uh, in fact, they are also automatically expungible uh, with a few exceptions, but I'm 
which I'm going to cover later in the pothole. And finally, just a quick reminder, motor vehicle code violations are not expungeable, um, including DWI. They cannot be expunged, but they won't bar your expungement of your other convictions. Because again, motor vehicle code violations are not criminal code violations, so they're not reached by this expungement process. Okay, so um, let's say you have six disorderly persons convictions, or you have two indictable convictions. That means you're not eligible for a whole record expungement today, five years after the fact, let's, let's say. But under the new statute, you are eligible for a partial record expungement. So to partially expunge a petitioner's record, um, this slide's gonna be looking mighty familiar to folks. You have these same four preliminary requirements. No charges currently pending, no non-expungible convictions. We know what that is now. Um, no subsequent convictions. Um, and the timing requirements must be met. So this is, this is an important wrinkle. No subsequent convictions, okay? So I have this bucket of things that I want to expunge. Um, if something has happened since this bucket, I can't expunge anything. However, if I have this bucket over here that I want to expunge, and something happened before this bucket, under the new statute, I can expunge my most recent convictions. My most recent convictions can be expunged. So if I have one, if I say I have two indictables, one was 10 years ago and one was 15 years ago, I can expunge the indictable that was, only, that was 10 years ago. The 15 years ago one stays on the record. 10 years ago, I can expunge. Um, if I have six disorderly persons convictions, the five most recent ones, so long as the appropriate amount of time has passed, can be expunged. And that sixth one cannot be expunged. Um, and the same thing with uh, with a combination, right? Um, whether it's uh, multiple indictables or four or more disorderly persons, um, the most recent ones can be expunged, but the remainders stay on the record. So you might be thinking, well, what good is that? Well, for one thing, um, you know, the the more recent things coming off the record, it's helpful. It can be helpful in housing and job applications. Uh, for another thing, though, uh, segue to next slide. The uh, clean slate expungement comes into play. So the clean slate expungement is a new form of relief available um, as of February this year for petitioners who are not otherwise eligible for relief. Again, too many indictables, too many disorderly persons. Um, these folks can file uh, to expunge their entire criminal history record so long as the following things are true. First, 10 years need to have passed since final release from supervision, probation, parole, and final payment. Again, 10 years since all punitive measures have been taken and completed. Uh, next, no non-expungible convictions. We talked about those. And all fines need to have been paid or the civil judgment will be entered for the amount outstanding. The fourth and final criterion is that automated clean slate cannot yet have been created. Now, this sounds like an impediment. It's actually it's kind of a good thing. So um, the new statute that went into effect um, created a task force that was to do some research and produce a report to the legislature and the governor um, in February of this year about the viability of uh, automated clean slate expungement. What needs to happen in order for automated clean slate, clean slate expungement to take place? With COVID, the report was, the due date was delayed uh, to November. Um, as of yet, I do not have up-to-date information on whether we have a report, um, but folks can expect that this will probably take a little bit of time. Um, these things don't happen overnight. It's gonna be probably on the order of months and years before we have an automated clean slate expungement. So it's worthwhile to get familiar with a non-automated clean slate expungement. So again, if a petitioner is not otherwise eligible for relief, um, they can file for a clean slate expungement so long as 10 years have passed and all the other criteria have been met. All right, let's talk about the pot. So three things that I'm gonna cover um, on this slide. First, um, regrading for purposes of eligibility. And, and I'm gonna preface this by saying there are sort of two, two different worlds uh, in New Jersey right now. There's the criminal enforcement criminal law enforcement world, um, and there is the expungement world. And they are separate. They have, they have interlinking parts, but they are separate. So today's presentation is about expungement. I'm going to focus on expungement. Uh, the thing you need to know in regard to criminal law 
is that there is a there's a regulated marijuana market or there one day will be in theory and there's an unregulated marijuana market the unregulated marijuana market is still illegal uh the regulated marijuana market um will be legal um, and will not be you know a basis for criminal offenses in new jersey <laughs> however for purposes of expungement um there are a number of things that have been regraded uh, in order for a petitioner to be eligible for an expungement. So we talked several slides ago about um, second and third and fourth degree uh, marijuana uh, or controlled dangerous substances convictions. So under the new statute, sale, distribution, or possession with intent to distribute marijuana, so long as it is less than five pounds, or hashish, so long as it is less than one pound, um, is treated as a disorderly person's conviction for purposes of expungement. It is not treated as an indictable. So what does this mean for the petitioner? This means you can have up to five of these on your record, as opposed to um, up to one for purposes of expungement. Um, the other <clears throat> important regrading is uh, marijuana convictions that were formerly disorderly persons convictions um, will now not be counted uh, for purposes of expungement. So these are things like possession, being under the influence, failure to turn over marijuana or hashish. Again, no longer counted for purposes of expungement. So what does this mean? This means you can have, you can have five, you can have 10. Uh, they can all be expunged. They are not counted against the total number on a petitioner's record. Uh, next thing to note, there will be automatic sealing of these decriminalized convictions going forward. Uh, the last time I, I looked at this, there were some, it was 320,000 outstanding charges and un, um, unexpunged convictions, and some 80,000 had been either dismissed or expunged. So it is, it is happening, um, but it's taken a while. So some folks would like to do these on their own, you know, uh, file the, the expunged petition. Other folks would rather just wait it out. They are both options. Um, automatic sealing will be taking place for folks who have um, decriminalized marijuana convictions. Um, and then finally, looking backwards uh, for expungement for uh, petitioners who have uh, prior convictions, again, can apply now um, to have those convictions expunged. There's no waiting period for these marijuana convictions. Um, or again, you can wait for the automatic. Um, and for those petitioners who are convicted of the sale, possession, or, or uh, possession with intent to distribute of um, less, up to five pounds of marijuana, up to one pound of hashish, that waiting period is reduced. So again, this would be an indictable um, with a five-year waiting period. Uh, it's been regraded as a disorderly person's conviction for purposes of eligibility uh, of the record. It's been regraded um, for purposes of the calendar with a three-year waiting period instead of a five-year waiting period. So all in all, um, good news for folks with marijuana convictions on their records. All right, now briefly, I'm gonna touch on the actual filing process. Um, so in the past, you needed about 15 data points um, to file for an expungement petition in New Jersey. You had to do it all in paper, and there was this fantastic web application that our partners at Legal Services in New Jersey put together called Clearing Your Record Online, where you put in your information and it would actually pre-fill the forms and you could print them out. It's very, very useful. But now um, what we have in New Jersey is a free e-filing system. Anybody can access this. Um, you do not need to be an attorney. You go online and, and you can access your criminal history record um, and you can file for an expungement of that record on your own or, or with the help of an attorney, either way. But it is free, there's no charge to file for expungement. And the way that it works is you really only need one uh, case number in order to pull up your entire criminal history record. Now, the system is not foolproof. We always encourage our clients to get a backup, um, ideally from the state police, and I'll, I'll cover that in a second, um, a backup criminal history record. But uh, this database is, is very useful for getting preliminary data, getting a good idea of what's on your record. And in most cases, we have found that the, um, the records that it returns are accurate. So to get um, a case number, you know, ideally you might have some of your court paperwork from whenever this took place. Uh, but if not, there are some public databases where you can find this information. Promise Gavel is available 
uh, and you can Google these. They're, they're readily accessible, publicly accessible. So the promised gavel is available uh, if you are processed in the superior court. These are typically indictable convictions, not always, but, but often. Um, the municipal court case search is available if you're processed in municipal court. Um, and in my experience, almost all of my clients uh, who are seeking an expungement have something in municipal court, whether or not they have something in superior court. So the municipal court case search, very easy to use. All you need is your full name and your birth date, and it will pull up everything associated with that um, identifier, including court case numbers. Um, and so you can put in a case number to the expungement portal, and that will bring up everything that the court has uh, access to online. Uh, the other way to get this information again is to ask the police. You can visit njsp.org. Um, you'll have uh, you'll have to fill out an application. It's pretty short, and there is a fee, which last I checked was about $42. Um, they will then send you to a professional fingerprinting agency to have your fingerprints taken. They will run your fingerprints and they will print out and mail to you a copy of the criminal history record that is associated with your fingerprints. Um, and that's a good backup. It's a good way to check to make sure that everything on your criminal history record is reflected in the court database and that nothing that is not on your criminal history record is reflected in the court database. We also want to make sure you're not you know, expunging somebody else's criminal record uh, or have your fingerprints associated with, with a stranger. So the process is that you once you have your case number, you'll input that case number. You'll review uh, what's called a party court history report that the expungement uh, portal produces for you. Uh, it's just a list of all the convictions um, and the courts where they took place. Uh, you'll confirm that that information is accurate, confirm the certifying information, um, and certify that you're um, under penalty of perjury. And remember, perjury is a non-expungible offense. You're going to certify that everything you're saying is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge. Nothing that you're saying is willfully false. And then you click submit. Um, the court will Submit your expungement petition. They'll give notice to all the proper parties. That's another step that you get to skip. Um, the prosecutor will review your record uh, to determine whether it's eligible or whether they have a basis to object. For example, if you're trying to expunge six disorderly persons convictions and it's only been two years, they, they would object because that doesn't follow the statutory requirements. Assuming that they don't object, which is the case uh, most of the time when you've gotten these, these requirements correct, um, then they will notify the court that they don't object. The court will enter an order granting the expungement and uh, your record will be expunged and all the appropriate parties will again be notified by the court. Um, so it's, it's really a fantastic uh, system, a lot of improvement. And um, we are we're very happy to help folks uh, work on it. So um, Carol has better better contact info, but uh, you can call or visit us. Um, this is the number to my office here, uh, 973-285-6911. And um, you can visit us on our website, lsnwj.org. Um, if you're not in our five counties, you can also visit our colleagues um, at Legal Services of New Jersey, and this is their contact info. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for your time and attention, um, and I'll pass it back to Carol. Thank you, Scott. That was great um, information. Um, people are coming in with questions. I just wanted to uh, throw up this screen um, about what we do. Again, um, we provide uh, free legal services for eligible people uh, who reside in our five counties of Hunterdon, Morris, Somerset, Sussex, and Warren counties. Um, and there is an eligibility process. Um, we also have legal projects. Um, so services are free for people aged 60 and older. Um, and for other people, there is an uh, income and asset limits, but they're very broad right now. We have expanded eligibility and it depends on the number of people in your household and the type of case you have and matter. So I encourage everyone to um, be sure to contact us. Feel free to email me at this email, cspicer at lsnj.org. If you have a question that isn't answered here today, or if you want to reach out to Scott in some fashion and we can um, pursue it. So I see we have a question um, about the presentation. Yes, I will send you the link to the presentation um, to review. And we will also have it up on our YouTube channel, LSNWJ Media for a limited period of time. Um, for people to review and, and share. 
Um, so we will certainly make that available. Um, other questions might be, um, Scott, why might somebody want to consult an attorney? I know the mat material is dense perhaps, or perhaps there's uh, difficulty in accessing the information, but it's, it is great that the law is becoming uh, clear and easier to access. What are your thoughts about, about consulting an attorney? Absolutely. So um, the, the statute was written so that folks could do this on their own. However, in my experience, um, legislators don't necessarily have the same expectations of um, the public's ability to do something as, as an individual does. So, you know, it, it's a fantastic system and it is continuing to improve. Um, however, it's, it's a lot easier for a lawyer who does this regularly to, to do another one than it is for a petitioner who ideally will be doing this one time in his or her life to figure it all out on the fly and do it correctly the first time. Some folks are, are less comfortable in the courthouse. Um, some folks are less comfortable navigating this technology and, and there is a good deal of de technology that, that goes along with it. And some folks just wanna to talk to a lawyer. Um, you know, you have questions and there are also plenty of specific circumstances that come into play. Um, public interest expungements in particular um, are good ones to consult an attorney on. Uh, anything where additional paperwork might be required uh, of the court, it's a good time to, to get a lawyer involved. And of course we are free. Um, so um, no time like the present to, to reach out and uh, get connected. Other thoughts about legal services or about expungements? Um, expungement petitions out there? Questions for people? So again, if you want to review this um, at leisure later, you'll have the opportunity. And if you have questions at that point that you would like to follow up with, please do feel free to email or call um, for a consultation. Um, and even if you just aren't sure whether to refer someone else, whether they would be eligible or for um, our services, feel free to reach out to me and I can try to steer you in the right direction. Thank you for joining us today, this sort of lunchtime opportunity to learn about this area of the law. And we hope that you will sign up for our mailing list on our website so we can let you know about other um, opportunities for community education in the future. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Scott, for your helpful information. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Carol. I have a, oh, there's a comment. Yes, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you all around. Thanks for attending today, everybody.